Hello and welcome to this month's installment of the Risk Insights monthly video blog series. My name is Ray Lukic and I'm a director and analytical team lead at S&P Global Market Intelligence, Global Risk Services. Today I will talk about developments in bank risk rating systems. While the appropriate level of complexity of a bank's risk measurement system is specific to each institution and portfolio type, and we know that one size does not fit all, we are seeing more and more banks adopting a dual risk ratings process. I should note that a risk rating from a bank should not be confused with a credit rating issued by a credit rating agency. In this dual risk rating system, the probability of default, or PD, is estimated separately from the loss given default, or LGD. The expected loss for a given loan is, is then calculated as their product. This method is also among several valid options for estimating expected credit loss explicitly contemplated in FASB's uh, proposed standards update, also called the Current Expected Credit Loss Model, or CECL. This indicates that banks are already thinking about ways to replace the existing incurred loss estimation approach to an expected loss type of model. And as we know, the allowance for credit losses is one of the most significant estimates on a bank's financial statement and regulatory report because it has a direct impact on earnings. The uh, dual risk rating system that uh, separates PD and LGD assessments uh, have initially emerged because a single risk rating may not support all of the functions that require credit risk evaluations. Borrower risk ratings typically support deal structuring and uh, administration, while facility risk ratings support allowance for loan and lease losses, or ALLL, and also capital estimates. So, how do banks build these systems uh, in practice? For banks with sufficient internal data, PD, LGD, and EAD models uh, are typically based in large part on the bank's own historical default and loss experience. However, we know that most banks do lack sufficient data for creating such models. So banks that find themselves in this situation uh, have several options available. First of all, it is often possible for, for example, for smaller community banks with relatively uh, straightforward portfolios to estimate expected losses directly without going into individual components, uh, uh, PD and LGD, based on their historical loss experience, coupled with the, some judgmental assessments of the uh, current economic uh, conditions. And the second option is uh, for banks to build a more robust custom PD or LGD models based on external data, such as that which is provided by S&P Global Market Intelligence, which can um, be sampled in such a way as to uh, represent the bank's own portfolio. And then the third option for banks facing data constraints is the use of uh, vendor models and scorecards to estimate PD and LGD separately, and then in turn also expected losses. These models should be, of course, reviewed to make sure that they are appropriate uh, relative to the composition of the bank's uh, loan portfolio. And we do suggest out-of-sample validation, calibration, and benchmarking um, as, as common exercises uh, to ensure that the models are going to be applicable uh, to the bank portfolio. So in practice, we find that oftentimes banks prefer to rely on this third option, the vendor models, and scorecards, regardless of their internal data situation, since such models have undergone uh, model validation, are maintained by the vendor, and represent leading industry practices. So in summary, uh, the increasingly popular uh, dual risk rating systems require a risk rating on the uh, credit worthiness of the borrower, on the one hand, and then a risk rating based on the facility of the loan, on the other hand. The two risk ratings are then combined using a uh, matrix such as the one shown here on this slide to develop an overall composite loan quality risk rating. That's all for today. I'm Rad Lukic and thank you for watching.